Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First Lutheran Church from wherever you are. We're thankful that you are worshiping with us from your home or wherever it might be. It's good to have you here. I'm Pastor Lori. Pastor Steve. And uh, we're looking forward to this time of worship when we get to let go of the why of things and beings in the world and just enjoy them. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Ah. In this world that tries to pit it, pigeonhole everyone. Don't you feel that way t lately? Uh-huh. Yeah, so today we're going to let go of that with the Canaanite woman, and I'll go into more of it later. First of all, um, we had a wonderful um, outdoor, a little chilly uh, on Wednesday, but um, prayer service in which we got to contemplate uh, Psalm 85 and also had Julia neuter there to teach us sign language. Uh, um, helping out um, Debbie so that we could um, learn the refrain of For the Beauty of the Earth. So if you haven't had a chance, go on our website under Nurturing Faith and Music Resources, and you can learn yourself. And the next, because the next Wednesday service is on the fourth Wednesday, that's August 26th, I believe. Something like that. Yes. 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 Uh, so, but only come if you feel comfortable. I know it's not for everyone, um, but if you do, come with your lawn chair and your face coverings. And, and we also recorded on Wednesday, so we will post that online as well when it's available. Okay. Do you have anything else, Pastor Steve? Mm. No. Okay. Well, let's enter into this beauty yeah. for the beauty of the earth. When we accept the non-utilitarian goodness of life, a world that doesn't need a why, we tune into the raw delight in the world. Yes, beauty decenters our ego by helping us realize that life is its own justification. As we let go of how everything relates to us, serves us, benefits us, we begin to appreciate all things for their own worth, their own beauty, and our desire for their flourishing intensifies. Yes, when we turn this idea onto our own selves, we can let go of the expectations of others and the societal standards of beauty that often define ourselves. For the beauty of the
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's pray. Divine goodness, Holy One, pause us for this moment. Bear us up in this time. Hold us for eternity. We turn our spirits to truth. We begin to let go of expectations. We allow all beings the fullness of their own beauty. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Today, as we dive into God's Word, as we listen with Lectio Divina, this divine listening, we will hear from Isaiah and from the Song of Solomon. Uh, and you probably haven't spent much time in the Song of Solomon. It doesn't come up in our lectionary very often, but it's it's beautiful, rich poetry. Uh, this adoration for the other that it's it's full of metaphors from nature and and in this passage we're we're invited to see with this wonder that there is no flaw in beauty beauty has always been meant from the divine to be something that we behold that's not dependent on our judgment of the beholder. And we do that. We instantly decide a lot of things before a person even says their first word or from something that they type on Facebook. Today, Lectio Divina and our scripture invites us into more and more into this compassion, this letting go of our judgments and to Lift us up so that we might adore all things, even as we hear ourselves being called dearest, beloved, and whom this letter addresses. Think about that as well as you hear Jesus interact with the Canaanite woman in our gospel. Ah, oh, this freedom from the why.
let us begin with a reading from the prophet Isaiah, who uh, calls upon Israel to do justice in view of God's imminent intervention to save. Righteousness and obedience define who belongs to the Israelite community, not race, nationality, or other category. Listen now for God's word for you from uh, the book of Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the Song of Solomon. Listen once again for God's word for you this day. Chapter 4. How beautiful you are, my love. How very beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind the veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one of them is bereaved. Your lips are like a crimson thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in courses. On it hang a thousand bucklers all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will hasten to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. The word of the Lord. Look at you, so beautiful, my dearest. Look at you, so beautiful. Look at your eyes, sweet as doves, behind the veil that your hair makes as it cascades from your head like a flock of young goats, black ones bounding down off Mount Gilead. And your teeth are sheep, white as the day they were born, were newly shorn and freshly washed, each with its perfect mate. Not one of them is alone. Why should we be? And ah, oh, the lips of that lovely mouth, a ribbon of scarlet. Your temples behind that veil glow like the halves of a freshly sliced pomegranate. Your neck has the grace of David's tower, with its jewels hung round it like the shields of a thousand warriors. And your breasts, like the twin fawns of a gazelle hiding among the lilies. All my nights, till the sun comes chasing its shadows, let me play in these perfumed hills, these mountains scented with myrrh. You are utterly beautiful, my dearest not a single flaw in you. Thank you. 
the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. And just before this uh, encounter, Jesus teaches his disciples that true purity is a matter of the heart rather than outward religious, religious observances. Almost immediately the teaching is tested when a woman considered to be a religious outsider approaches him for help. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Is my, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and she knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I peeked back at the sermon I gave on this gospel text three years ago from 2017. It's the first time in a long time that I could easily preach it as it is without changing a thing. Tempting it was, but I'm not going to. Yet as I read through it, the Lord have mercies. Words echo echoing the Canaanite woman's cry, Lord, help me. These cries in response to almost exactly the same situations back then as today. Yet today it's all been amplified and we need this message more than ever beauty in a world without a why. But how do we get there? How do we address this need to rediscover God's definition of beauty and worth, this need to pay attention to God's word, and, and the care that we need to take when, when we claim the mission that we share in Christ's name includes serving all. Because it's becoming very clear our definition of all and God's definition of all, it's not the same thing. All you have to do is listen into a conversation on the street or look at a Facebook post or read the emails friends and family share or watch the news, which I'm trying hard not to. And it doesn't take long before we have dismissed the other because of something that they said, wrote, the way they look, the generational group that they fall into, or their legal status. It doesn't take long before we've justified our reasons why all doesn't really mean all. If some people and parts of creation you can hear it everywhere. People believing that there are some that are truly beyond God's grace, God's redemption, inclusion, and worth. And it's a scary thing to ponder. But it, the thing is, we're not the first ones to do this. The Bible is full of examples of how people of faith justified not caring for some in our communities. Lepers, demon-possessed, sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors, 
Gentiles and lawbreakers like the woman who was caught in adultery. And the list could go on. And here in the Gospel of Matthew, we even catch Jesus objectifying the other. A Canaanite woman, she doesn't even get a name, and her daughter. We hear him say that he's only here for the Israelites, not the Gentiles, those dogs fighting for scraps at his feet. Well, hopefully you haven't been so desensitized by the name-calling dominating our current culture that you didn't cringe when you heard the story. If you back up a bit in chapter 15, leading up to this moment, Jesus has been calling the religious leaders hypocrites. They are more concerned with ritual practices than what motivate, motivates people's actions. So Jesus teaches, it's what comes out of the heart, out of one's mouth, that defiles. For out of the heart, he says, comes all evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are the things that show what you're feeding in your heart the wheat or the weeds, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, the power of sin or trust in God's promises, those two wolves. What do we feed? Which one do we feed? That's the one who wins. Or as I've quoted from Wendy Farley in our Wednesday worship, we can tell whether we are worshiping the divine goodness or an idol of our imagination by the fruits of our worship. Love, compassion, social justice are the fruits of loving God. Cruelty, hubris, that's arrogance, selfishness, hostility to creation suggests that whatever names for God we are using, we are worshiping an idol. And it is. You can see it all around. We are falling for idols rather than the true God. So what do we do when it comes out of Jesus' own mouth? Well, there are some possibilities. It could be a response of grief. In the previous chapter, Jesus learns of John the Baptist's murder by Herod took his head off. Maybe annoyance has been building up in Jesus in response to his disciples' lack of trust on the rough waters of the Sea of Galilee. And then pair that with the religious leaders' focus on the letter of the law rather than the intent of it. I mean, it's hard for us to understand in the midst of a pandemic because hand-washing has become very serious business. But for Jesus, at that moment with the Pharisees, all the Pharisees could see was the disciples and that they were not washing their hands before they ate. That was their focus rather than all of the blatant claims that they were making in God's name that caused hardship for God's people. This really pushed Jesus' buttons. And I know I've had buttons pushed lately, and I'm sure you have as well, and we're not reacting all that great to them. So in a lot of ways, it's nice to see Jesus' human side. That even Jesus, who obeyed God, followed God's ways, trusted God's claim and identity on his life, even Jesus could have a bad day. But some do try to explain it as a, maybe a test for the disciples, to see if they paid attention to his teaching, maybe even held a mirror up to them so that they could recognize their own prejudices the ways in which they were objectifying the least or the outcast 
or justifying that their ministry might not be to all. Others, they suggest that Jesus is testing the woman and her belief in Jesus' ability to heal her daughter. Which also makes Jesus and God sound awful. I mean, who wants to follow someone or a God who would play with a mother's emotions when she's desperate to save her daughter? But what if? What if in this moment, Jesus really did lose sight of the beauty of all God's creation? Or that he actually believed that he was only sent to the people of Israel, God's chosen ones. But it took this woman or the Holy Spirit to jar Jesus' vision. Yes, she dares to cry out, Lord, help me. This foreigner, this woman, she would not make it convenient for Jesus and his disciples. Yes, she knows her value, and she believed in God, the Creator, who also gave value to all things. So she won't be silenced, ignored, dismissed, or intimidated. Yes, for all to hear, she answers Jesus' cold shoulder and says, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus finally hears her cries for help, recognizes this mother and daughter as part of God's all. And this is a message that is found throughout Scripture. From Isaiah, verse 6, out of our reading today. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath, do not profane it, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And from the Song of Solomon, both Jews and Christians, they've read this rich poetry as an allegory of God's relationship with Israel, or Christ's relationship with the church. A love song to us, metaphorically describing how God the Creator sees us, God's creation, humankind, made in God's own image. Beautiful, dear, with no flaw in us. Creation and humankind before nations formed or had boundaries or clung to identities or all the other categories that we impose on each other. God's vision beautiful, without a why, without anything we can actually do that is useful for God. Just a relationship. A relationship God will not give up on. And a vision of community that God still believes is possible. God hasn't given up on us. This relationship with God that can create a community in which all are valued and loved now and forever. Let us pray for the beauty of the earth. Gracious God, we come before thee. Come thou also unto we, where we find thee and adore thee. There a heaven on earth must be. To our hearts, O oh, enter thou, let them be thy temple now. Amen.
We turn now to our confession of faith. Trusting deeply in God's forgiveness, we can come as we are with things we're struggling with and also uh, embrace that we indeed are beautiful in God's eyes. We believe in God who made us in God's own image. We live, we love, we laugh because we are like God. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. He had the last laugh on the devil when he rose from the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Son. Our counselor, our guide, our motivator, the Spirit is our joy. Forgive us, O God. When we take ourselves too seriously, when we lose sight of your divine goodness, when we don't claim the happiness that is rightfully ours as your children, when we forget that you will have the last laugh in this world, restore to us the joy of our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. Through Christ you have been given grace upon grace. Your sins are forgiven. Yes, let us live together now in hope. Amen. Amen. Confident of God's care and upheld by the Holy Spirit, we pray now for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Um, responding today with the Canaanite woman to each petition, help us, O Lord. Oh Lord, we pray for the church around the world, for humility where the church is dominant, for courage where it is oppressed, and for faithfulness when we cannot assemble for worship. Bless your church, faithful God. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray for your bountiful earth, for cleaner air, for the fields on which our food grows, for the renewal of lands and waters that have suffered from disregard. Protect your earth, creative God. Help us, O oh God. We pray for the nations of the earth, for the peaceful re resolution of, of disputes around the world, for just policies that care for the poor, for the upcoming political conventions in our land. Save humankind, sovereign God. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray for all in need of healing for the residents of Beirut and other distressed cities, for those suffering from hurricane, tornado, and other damage, for those sick and dying of COVID-19, for the unemployed, for people without medical care, for medical workers and researchers, for the outcasts of our society. <clears throat> for Paul, Russell, for Chuck, Leo, Chris, Michael, Randy, Nikki, Wendy, Shauna, Gerda, Debbie, Kara, Kai, Tom, 
Hunter, Eugene, Marge, Mike, Vi, Sierra, Sylvia, Janet, and all those we name before you at this time. Heal the sick, merciful God. Help us, mm -hmm. O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray for schools around the globe, for educators who must plan for the fall, for children and students without the resources to access remote learning, for safety, for peace, for wisdom, for courage. Guide us, guide them, compassionate God. Help us, Lord. We pray finally for ourselves, for whenever we feel tormented by demons, and for all our family and friends. Loving God. Help oh. us, O oh Lord. We celebrate with Carson and Jarvis as they begin their life together as husband and wife. We mourn the deaths of those we love. And we praise you for the lives of all your faithful people. At the end, gather us all into the joy of your presence. Grant us salvation, eternal God. Help us, O oh Lord. In the sure and certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We turn now and offer thanks for all the many ways in which God has blessed us and for all the ways in which God is opening our heart to see the blessings that continue without end. Thanks be to God. We turn now to God's table, wherever you may be, this amazing sacrament of God's promise matched with bread and wine or grape juice. Go ahead and, and gather these, these elements, these ordinary things which God makes extraordinary for us today. Beautiful, divine. Food for life. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, divine goodness in the flesh, come to love us in the flesh. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, 
he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the beauty of life through Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, offering the lifeblood of compassion. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry to all the world until Christ indeed comes in final victory and we feast in the heavenly banquet that has no end. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, please share this meal with one another, those that are at your table. And for those who are on their own today, please join in sharing this, this feast that has no end with Pastor Steve and I. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Body of Christ, given for you. Amen. And the blood of Christ, shed for you. Let us pray. O oh God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. Amid the cares of this life, strengthen us to love you with all our heart, serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Okay, it's time for our ritual action for the week. Um, and in the search for beauty this week that I spy, I have a question for you first. What is shiny and reflects one of the most beautiful things on earth when you look into it? Can you guess? You want a clue? <laughs> okay, so if you want to see if you have something in your teeth, what do you look in? A mirror. <gasps> yes! Okay, so go ahead. Go find, find a mirror somewhere in your home. So what do you see? Can you see me in the mirror? No. no? What? Uh, uh, huh. Um, what? So why can't you see me? I can only see me. I don't know. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. So mirrors only show ourselves. But hey, look at that. <laughs> there you are. Here I am. <laughs> Yes, so it's, it's, it's a good thing to see yourself in the mirror. It is a good thing because today the Song of Solomon basically wrote a love letter to you from God and told you, look how beautiful you are. Did you hear that today? Do you? Uh, ah. Ah. <laughs> See, it's always when uh, the the preacher gets it back. <laughs> no, because it is sometimes hard for us to believe that we are beautiful. And not only kids, but adults struggle with it too. I should say kids of all ages have a hard time believing. But it's true. And you can trust this because God says so. And what God that says, love letter is to each of us, to all of us. Exactly, exactly, and it, and we're exactly who we're supposed to be, um, and God says, you're beautiful. What if we walked around and remember that every day? Because a lot of people are telling us right now that we're not beautiful because of what we think or believe or don't have the right hair or clothes or you name it. Um, we're just not taking care of each other very well, period. So this week we really need to hear this and get permission and some help um, from God to look in the mirror. And so to even do this more to r remind you because you know how, what happens. You look in the mirror and you go, ooh, look at that pimple. Or, you know, that hair growing in on the spot on my chin. Um, I know, younger kids something to look forward to. So, um, but with an adult's help or um, do it yourself, um, get get one of those washable markers and, and draw a heart on your mirror right where your face will be. Okay? And write, I love you. Think you can do that? So every time you brush your teeth or you wash your hands, and I know you're doing that a lot lately, look at your face and the heart and know how God feels about you. And then, if you cannot do this, maybe you don't have a mirror handy or um, parents are not excited about um, putting hearts on their mirrors, um, or maybe you're just having a hard time believing um, that you're beautiful or that judgment voice, there's that critical voice that likes to creep in and um, fills our minds and our hearts, um, go ahead and set a reminder, okay, um, uh, on your phone or whatever, uh, that every time you hear it, I want you to let go of all those should be's, you know, and the oughts. Um, and imagine these thoughts, maybe hold your hands out in front of you, all these should-be's, all these critical voices that come into your, um, your head, 
Imagine those thoughts lifted up and raised away. That God's just taking them going, uh-uh. That's not who you are. And feel that, feel that heaviness of measuring up. Let it just drift away and replace it with compassion. Compassion for yourself. Because when we're compassionate to ourselves, it's much easier to be compassionate to others. And I'm just getting hit on the side of the head with the Holy Spirit right now because I was very grumbly with <laughs> a neighbor um, just the other day. So, they are beautiful. I am beautiful. Pastor Steve is beautiful. Yes, and you all are beautiful because God loves us and we are a part of the beauty of creation. And guess what? Yes, we learned this at on Wednesday. Um, like this. Yes. Beautiful. That's beautiful in, in sign language. So imagine a heart around your face, God's voice in your head, so that we can oh, go forth going, yes, to the world, singing Carry the song it. of all creation that's already in progress. The world is so varied and beautiful. Seek wisdom wherever it is to be found. And may the goodness of the Creator, the companionship of the Christ, and the insight of the Spirit infuse your life now and forever. Amen. Amen.